Hi, everybody. Welcome to Wines for the Weather, an LCBO virtual event. My name is Charlene Rook, and I'm the drinks editor of Food and Drink, which is the in-store magazine at the LCBO. I'm a drinks journalist, as well as a wine and spirits educator, and I've been involved with Food and Drink for about 10 years. I'm really pleased to introduce you today to my co-host, who happens to be my colleague there. It's the food editor of Food and Drink, Eric Vellens. Hi, Eric. Happy spring. Hey. Hey, Charlene, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Eric, do you want to introduce yourself to all of our viewers today? Sure. I'm the uh, food editor at Food and Drink, and I've been a contributor for over six years. I've worked in the food business in some way or another for three decades. That ages me a bit. Um, I've been a baker, a line cook, catering chef, a restaurant reviewer, a wine critic, and a recipe columnist. But um, I'm currently doing what I love most is sort of sharing my passion and recipes with uh, the home cook. Amazing. And that's exactly what we'll be doing today is sharing some recipes from the archives at lcbo.com. So I should just tell all of our viewers that we are live with you today. This is not a recorded event. So if you have questions about wine pairing, about spring food, about wines you're finding at the LCBO, You've got the experts in front of you. If you're a food and drink fan or you buy your wines in Ontario, we'd like to hear from you with your pairing questions. So our session today is actually based on an article that I wrote in the spring issue of Food and Drink. And it's called Wines for the Weather. And the concept is that Canadian spring can be a bit of an iffy thing. We can have days that really have cool weather, almost like end of winter weather, when you really want a richer wine and maybe some really warming food. But then you wake up one day and you've got a spring day that's warm, it's light and bright, the sun is out, and suddenly we're craving something that tastes a little more of the summer to come. Maybe we want a lighter, crisper wine and some fresher, springy, early summer type of food. And so the idea that we had is that there are certain wine grapes that actually can be very versatile and they're made around the world in different styles. So whether it's a wine grape you already love or one you're not as familiar with it, we're gonna introduce you to two different styles of that particular wine. The idea is that one of them can be paired with a dish that's lighter and brighter and ready for warmer days to come. And one of them can be paired with slightly heavier food for those chilly days we no doubt have left before the season officially turns. Um, so we do have 10 wines in front of us today, which is a lot. I don't know about you, Eric, but I don't normally have 10 glasses in front of me, even with a tasting sample. Uh, I think everyone watching today is safe in their own home, but we just want to remind you to drink responsibly. And I think Eric and I both have a good old spit cup in front of us. Ready to go. Okay. So let's launch into this. Uh, keeping in mind, we're open to your questions. If you have a pairing question or you want some more detail on one of the wines or the dishes we show you, send them through. And you can, by the way, find all of these wines and all of the recipes. They're right there on the YouTube event description page and you'll be able to click through right to links for everything that you see here today. All right, first up is one of my favorite wines. And this is Sauvignon Blanc, which has become really one of the world's most beloved white wines, largely because of this country, New Zealand, which is where Whitehaven Sauvignon Blanc comes from. So we think of New Zealand, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc as being this beautiful, bright, crisp style. You'll often hear them called uh, grassy or maybe herbaceous. And when I smell this one, I get just a gorgeous aroma of lemongrass fresh herbs, lemon zest, lime. And when I taste it, there's really a gorgeous stone fruit thing going on there. It's kind of peachy, a little bit of nectarine flavor. And that's very characteristic of that style from Marlborough, which is the region of New Zealand where Whitehaven is made and where a lot of those really great grassy crisp Sauvignon Blanc come from. It's on the north part of the South Island of New Zealand, which is considered a cooler climate. And I always think that accounts for some of the crispness and restraint in this wine, that the grapes are grown in a cooler climate. So our more rich style wines 
would be another Sauvignon Blanc, but in this case, grown in California. And this wine happens to be from Rodney Strong, which in vineyard years is getting to be quite an old vine planting. And I always think that when grapes come from old vines, they have a special kind of uh, maturity and complexity and a real fullness to the fruit that you just sometimes don't find in the younger vines. So this Charlotte's Home Vineyard is quite a special one. Because this is a warmer climate Sauvignon, it makes a lot of sense to me that I get some more tropical fruit kind of notes to this. So on the nose, I'm getting like a nice honeydew melon, maybe a little bit of passion fruit. And when I taste that one, it really is quite gorgeously rich. It's got not only those tropical fruits and still the bright acidity that the New Zealand Sauvignon had, but it's got something textural that's a little bit creamy or buttery. And so I think with these two wines, both being really bright and having those citrusy flavors, but quite different in body and style. Eric, I'm really excited to see what you'll do with these in terms of some food matches with some of the food and drink archive recipes. What have you got for us? So the Whitehaven uh, Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand, we're gonna pair with sushi cake squares. This is a recipe that's kind of sushi for people who are a little intimidated by making sushi. Cause all you do is you layer the rice, seaweed, avocado, shrimp, and smoked salmon in a pan. You kind of press it down and then just cut them into squares for a nice little appetizer. Love it. Uh, the New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs have this patented super zesty lemony acidity that acts like a squeeze of lemon on seafood and it also cuts through the richness of the avocado. Now if, with sushi in general, I like high acid whites like this. Um, you could also pair this with Chablis, a dry Riesling, and, and my favorite with sushi is a, a dry sparkling wine like Cava or, or Champagne. And you could also pair light lagers and sake with a dish like this. With a slightly richer, um, more tropical Rodney Strong uh, Sauvignon Blanc from California, we're pairing it with a Herbes de Provence veal with creamy brie. Now that's basically veal scallopini. It's been pan fried in butter and sort of rubbed with herbs before that and um, topped with brie and flashed on the broiler, which sort of melts and caramelizes the cheese. Um, if you yeah. know what Herbes de Provence is, is, it's a sort of a savory herb blend, dried herb blend from the south of France that includes thyme, savory, oregano, rosemary, marjoram, and occasionally lavender. Now the richer Sauvignon Blanc has more texture and weight to handle white meat, like veal, but it still has that bright acidity that will, will temper the, uh, the rich gooey cheese. Plus this Sauvignon Blanc has a real herbal character I find, and, and many do, and it, it's just perfect with that, um, the herbs of Provence. And I saw some asparagus on the side of that plate. And asparagus can be a really tough wine pairing because it's such a characterful vegetable, but a go-to for me often is one of these quite grassy, herbaceous Sauvignon Blanc. I find it's just got enough oomph to match with a tougher vegetable like asparagus that has really a lot of flavor of its own. And the other thing I loved about your pairing, you know, that sushi, I saw some little microgreens or shoots on it for garnish, but I also feel like that little hint of green that you're going to get when you bite into it is also going to be really complimentary with these super crisp, fresh, and herbaceous kind of wines. For sure. Um, Eric, we have a question already. More you of a do. wine question. Maybe we, can, uh, maybe we can put our brains together and try and answer it. We have Sophie who is asking where the name Sauvignon Blanc comes from. Uh, does the wine originate from France? Ooh, I'm going to wish I studied my wine textbook before this. <laughs> I actually think that although... Uh, France is very famous for this wine and the really great Sauvignon Blancs that you'll get from France. You might see them labeled Sancerre. Sancerre is a region in northern, northern France that makes really beautiful Sauvignon Blanc wines, but they will be called the region, Sancerre, not necessarily by the varietal. But I don't know if that's where the grape was originally cultivated and where the wine comes from but it certainly is related to other grapes in the Sauvignon family. I think at one time it was probably part of the same family as Cabernet Sauvignon because Sauvignon Blanc means Sauvignon White. Eric, you got any insight on that? Can you Wikipedia that for me? I do not, sorry. Okay, 
Well, I've got one that is for you. Buffy is also okay. one of our viewers. Hi, Buffy. Thanks for the question. And she wants to know what would be a good beverage to serve with a live lobster dinner. Now, I'm assuming the lobster is going to be prepared in some kind of a delicious way. We're going to boil him. We're going to steam him. We're going to serve him with butter. And what's your beverage well, text with that? If you're if you're splurging on lobster, I would splurge on a on a on a on a, a Chardonnay from Burgundy, which is sort of white Burgundy, um, something that's not not like Chablis, something that's like has a little more oak treatment, like a Montrachet, and those sort of rich buttery characteristics you get from sort of wine that has spent a little more time in a barrel will really complement um, the flavor of lobster, and plus those white burgundies do have acidity to help cut through the richness of, of lobster, for sure white burgundy, or any sort of oak Chardonnay if, 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 if white burgundy is out of your price range. That's a good point, Eric. So Buffy, you could head to the France section at the LCBO and pick out a white that is labeled to come from the region Bourgogne, uh, Burgundy in English. Or as Eric pointed out, you could probably get a lovely lightly oak Chardonnay. I'd suggest maybe Australia, uh, even some of the cooler parts of Northern California, Central Coast, you could get a nice buttery Chardonnay that's got some crisp acidity as well. That'd be gorgeous with lobster. Keep the questions coming, you guys. This is fun. Okay. Our next wine is another big global favorite made so many places around the world. But we're going to start with the kind of cradle where it comes from. So this is Pinot Grigio. And this particular bottling is Santa Margarita. And this is a vintages wine. It's actually a vintages essential. And I love picking wines from the Vintages Essentials list because Vintages collections change so often and it's exciting to watch what comes in and out, but the Essentials are always there. So if you love one and you know it's part of the Essentials collection, it's always there for you. Keep a few bottles in the fridge. You can go buy one at the last minute if you need it. So that's what's great about this Santa Margarita wine. So Northern Italy is also a cooler climate. And I always feel like these wines, when I try them, you see it even has the slightest of green tinges in the glass. They have a beautiful kind of green apple quality. It's just so crisp and bright. There is some citrus on that, kind of a lemon zest thing. Again, there's a little bit of stone fruit. Maybe there's a little bit of white peach. And I often find on the finish with Italian white wines, after I take a sip, I'm just left with a little bit of nuttiness, kind of warm, toasty, savory, little bit of nuttiness, even on these very light and crisp Pinot Grigio wines. And I love that about this one. And Eric, I think you've got an interesting pairing that plays on that note. So the second one in our kind of Pinot Grigio mini flight comes from California. And this one's called Long Shot, which is located south of San Francisco, so definitely a warmer part of California. And um, California generally being a warmer climate than Northern Italy, definitely I would expect to find some warmer kind of flavors in this wine. And indeed we do. When I give it a smell, I get a beautiful kind of lush, ripe pear. Even some blossoms, pear blossom, apple blossom. Very much cooked pear on the flavor. And there's a tropical, almost kind of banana, a uh, little bit of a mango note. So really does feel like warmer days and a slightly warmer climate. This to me is a little bit of a richer wine. It's still nice and crisp, but it's just got some lush, riper flavors. And Eric, I feel like these could present some interesting pairing possibilities for you. What have you got for us? So with the uh, Italian uh, Pinot Grigio Santa Margarita, we're pairing it with a, a Spanish-inspired uh, soup of yellow pepper and almonds. It happens to be vegan. It sort of just simmered and blended to very velvety, smooth parades you can see there. And sort of using nuts to simulate the creaminess of dairy is a, is a, is a very common vegan trick in cooking. Um, you see the little garnish of some toasted almonds, smoked paprika, and fragrant olive oil. Now, the lighter Pinot Grigio is just perfect with mm -hmm. sort of a lighter dish like this, and those, those peachy flavors go well with the almonds. And that nuttiness you you get on the finish for sure, um, is obviously perfect with almonds. In general, a well-chilled bottle of Pinot Grigio from Italy like this is great to put out with pre-dinner nibbles, appetizer spreads, or sort of light first courses. 
Now with the, the richer long shot Pinot Grigio from California, we're pairing it with a, a scallop and tuna ceviche with an avocado mousse. Now in this dish, scallops and tuna are cubed and cured in a bath of citrus juices and shallots and hot peppers and cilantro. And it sort of firms up the fish a little bit, but it still has that silky raw texture. And it's topped with um, an avocado mousse. And it may sound a bit intimidating, but literally it's just, it's like a s smooth guacamole. It's just throwing a bunch of ingredients into a food processor and hitting, hitting on for about 30 seconds. Um, the, the California Pinot Grigio is a better match here. It has more body to pair with that, that richer seafood like scallops and tuna, but it still has that fresh acidity that won't, won't get overpowered by the lime juice. And um, those tropical fl fruit flavors you were talking about, like banana and mango, they're just perfect with, with lime juice and cilantro. A lot of cultures will squeeze lime over fruit and, and put cilantro on top. Um, other wines I'd like to, I would pair with ceviche include sort of German or off dry Rieslings from Ontario. Uh, New Zealand, that Whitehaven, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc would be terrific with this. And there's this light, barely effervescent white wine from Portugal called Vino Verge. And it, it's, it's terrific mm. with uh, ceviche. Really would be. I love those pairings, Eric. That California wine with anything avocado just totally makes sense to me. And the soup, I almost feel like we could enjoy that as a chilled soup as well as warm. And again, that little bit of nuttiness from the almonds is going to be gorgeous. Yeah. Eric, I've got a couple questions for you from our viewers. Fire away. Um, so, yeah, Sue, thank you for your question. Sue is saying she's a huge Italian Prosecco fan, and she is wondering what Prosecco pairs best with. And that's a long list, so let's give Sue a few of your top ones. Uh. Prosecco, sparkling wine in general, and Prosecco in included, it does pair with just about it's so many things. Like, I really like sparkling wine like that with sushi. Um, mm. Fried foods, like potato chips, for sure, um, or, or French mm -hmm. fries or seafood fritters. Um, you could pair it with an antipasto spread, charcuterie sparkling wine, because that effervescence sort of refreshes your palate. Um, from all the salty foods. And uh, Prosecco has a little more residual sugar than other sparkling wines, and that's quite good with those salty meats. Um, yeah. it's, it really is, can go with quite a bit. And of course, in Northern Italy, like particularly in Venice, I associate Prosecco with kind of an aperitivo hour, and you might make it into a spritz, or you might have it with little cicchetti, little dishes of nuts or roasted chickpeas or charcuterie and cheese. Just perfect. Um, we've also got Sophie fielding a wine question. I'll jump in on this one. What is the difference between Pinot Grigio and Sauvignon Blanc? Well, they are actually completely different grapes, although they both make, can make nice crisp white wines. Sauvignon Blanc is considered an aromatic grape, and that means that on the nose, it literally has bold aromatics and some winemaking potential, potential to offer a really broad range of aromas and flavors. Pinot Grigio, really that textbook style of Pinot Grigio is light, crisp, lively. And although some of the really high quality ones from Northern Italy and some of the specific denominations there, like um, the Trentino and those areas, they will have a little bit of the characteristic of those Northern soils and they'll be a bit more nuanced. Pinot Grigio to me exists as a wine that is light, crisp, citrusy and is great as an aperitivo or on its own as well. Um, we've got a question on Riesling that I'm going to save till we get there. And I've got a question from Karen here, though. She's saying when we talk about a nutty flavor in wine, does that mean nuts were used in the creation? Because, of course, we know lots of people have nut allergies. And absolutely not, Karen. What we're talking about when we talk about all these wines when we smell peaches, there's no peach in the wine. When we smell lemon zest, nobody soaks the grape juice with lemons. But what happens is chemistry leaves its footprint behind so that different chemical aromas and flavors called esters have sort of a signature footprint and they sell, smell and taste a certain way. And so what we identify in a wine as peach or nuts or lemon is just kind of a chemical signature that's come from that grape juice being fermented, aged, 
treated with oak and lots of different winemaking techniques. Eric, anything you want to add to that explanation? If you want to try a wine that is very, very nutty, um, dry, bone dry fino sherry of Spain, really it tastes like a mouthful of raw almonds. It's, it's one of the nuttiest things. And obviously it goes extremely well with things like with uh, roasted nuts. And that, that is, has uncanny mimicking of, of the taste of nuts. It's, it's wonderful. I mean, it's an acquired taste, but it, once you've acquired it, you, re you really enjoy it. But no nuts are harmed in the making of Fino Sherry. <laughs> <laughs> no actual nuts. So Karen, you are safe with your nut allergy. Okay, uh, I'm going to go to our next pairing, which is another one of the world's most popular grapes, and it's Chardonnay. But our first bottle is maybe gonna trick you a bit. Eric, hold that one up, let's see the label. Because it doesn't quite say Chardonnay, it says Chablis. So again, when we're looking at what we call old world wines, which are made in places like France, Italy, and Spain, they often call the wine by the region where it's made, not the grape varietal. So when you see the word Chablis, that's the name of a region in Northern France where really, really beautiful, dry, mineral Chardonnay style wines are made. So that's our first Chardonnay, is the Albert Bichot Chablis, AOC, which is a denomination or a region in France. And this wine I know is a big favorite of Eric and I both. When you give it a whiff, a Chablis has what we would call minerality. And I know that sounds strange. Why do I want my wine to smell like rocks or chalk or slate? But it's a beautiful kind of dryness. And when you sip one of these wines with minerality, you get a beautiful freshness, a light astringency on your palate. It's so palate cleansing, and it really makes you crave the next taste of wine, the next sip, the next bite of food. So these mineral wines are just totally refreshing. What's nice about a Chablis, a high quality one like this, it also has a little bit of creaminess. I kind of taste it on the mid palate. And I know, Eric, you sometimes call it kind of a yogurty taste. It's almost a tang. And it's just gorgeous and means that this wine isn't just citrusy and light and bright. It has a little bit of body to it on the palate. A little bit of exotic spice too. Almost a whiff of something like cardamom. I just love it. So that's our lighter pick. And then we have a richer version of Chardonnay. And for lovers of Chardonnay, you know where the nice buttery ones come from. It's California. So this one is Josh Sellers, and it's one of the places in the world that really excel at a warmer climate style of Chardonnay. And as I've said a couple times now in this tasting, when we have wines, wines from a warmer area as opposed to a cool climate, we kind of expect these warmer flavors. And when we look at the Josh Sellers wine, you'll see it's a beautiful, almost canary yellow color. So that says to me, this wine has had some oak treatment. There it is on the nose. I've got a beautiful kind of toasty note like a bakery, like brioche or croissant. Buttery, a little hint of toaster smoke. There's some vanilla there. And it's full of blossoms. It's full of all kinds of spring blossoms. Orange blossoms, apple blossoms, white blossoms. So this one comes from a cooler area of California, Mendocino and Monterey. That's still California, though. It's got that beautiful mouth-coating richness that butteriness that people really covet in a Chardonnay that's been treated with oak by the winemaker. And although these come from the same grape, they really are totally different wine experiences in terms of the texture and the flavors. So Eric, tell us really where you'd go with those two. Now with the, the Bichot Chablis, uh, we're gonna pair it with a poached side of salmon with pea sprout vinaigrette. In this case, the salmon is barely gently cooked in a bath of white wine and fennel. It's cooled and served with a punchy vinaigrette and a sort of a salad of pea shoots there. Now I normally wouldn't pair a most Chablis with salmon. However, this preparation, this sort of spring preparation is, is, is light and it needs a light wine that's light enough for the gentle cooking, but still sturdy enough for the rich uh, oily fish. And Chablis perfectly fits the bill here. Plus, that, plus, you know, that chalky minerality that you like uh, is really nice with the vegetable flavors of the pea sprouts and that yogurty tang that I love in Chablis. 
uh, is terrific with fish. I mean, you'd serve a yogurt sauce with poached salmon. And with the richer, more oaked uh, California Chardonnay from Josh Sellers, we're pairing it with a whole wheat niçoise pasta. This sort of quick, quick uh, weeknight pasta is the love child of spaghetti carbonara and salad niçoise. So whole wheat pasta is tossed with raw eggs and lemon juice. Now the, the heat of the pasta cooks the eggs, but not that hard. So it, it's still very creamy and there's canned tuna and green beans and olives. I mean, there's a lot going on here and this full body shard has the weight and to stand up to everything that's going on and including the richness of the eggs and the whole flavors of the tuna and olives. And that smokiness you get from the oak pairs well, very well with the earthy uh, whole wheat pasta. Agreed. And actually your pairing for the Chablis reminds me of like an old rule that I learned in my wine studies, which is if you have something acidic in the food, in this case, we have a vinaigrette, right? You need a wine mm. that has equal brightness or acidity. Otherwise, the wine tastes flabby and flattens out the flavors of the food. So we should never be afraid to put a wine with bright acidity with a food with bright acidity. In fact, they're gonna match each other really well like they do in this case with the Chablis and the salmon with vinaigrette like you're suggesting. I love it. We've got a couple more questions. Our viewers are keeping us on our toes. We've got somebody who goes by a fun screen name of Deep Big Eyes and uh, asking about white wines. They can certainly be higher in acidity, you're right. And you're asking if we have any recommendations for a wine like a Chardonnay that's lower in acid. Eric, I'll let you think about it for a second, but I'll give you my pick, deep big eyes, whoever you are. Um, if somebody asks me for a low acid wine, what I actually usually give them is a Viognier. So that's a French word, V-I-O-G-N-I-E-R. Viognier is a beautiful, smooth, lush, aromatic white wine. And it doesn't have a lot of acid. When you drink it, it doesn't feel flabby or too mouth coating. It's, it's rich and soft and still has some of those nice apple and pear stone fruit flavors as well. But it doesn't have the high acid of a lot of the other white grapes. So that's usually my go-to recommendation. And, you know, some people can't handle a very high acid white. So Viognier is always one I feel confident recommending. Eric, have you got any ideas there for a lower acid white? I think a Gewürztraminer is another sort of low acid white, mm. it's, um, or it can be. Um, it's, it's an acquired taste because there's the gingery and very floral and the lychee. But um, I also, the, the, if, if, if high acid wines bother you, and I find more winemakers, even in warmer clients, are trying to build a city because it, it, it's great with food and a little more balanced. But if, if yeah. you have a low tolerance to it, I, I would say Gewürztraminer as well. Good call. So it's not that we're ruling out Chardonnay, deep big eyes. And if you're looking for a Chardonnay, I'll give you a tip. If you're buying it in a clear bottle, you'll be able to tell the color. But often uh, a Chardonnay that comes in a tinted bottle like this one, or if it's in a clear bottle and it looks quite canary yellow, like this beautiful Josh Sellers that I showed you, that'll mean it's been treated with some oak. And this actually gets to another question from Sophie, who's asking, how does the buttery flavor get into Chardonnay? Well, when white wines are made, the grape juice is fermented and the winemaker has some choices, which is how we start with a grape like Chardonnay and get so many wines in the end. One of the choices the winemaker can make is to put the wine in a stainless steel tank before, after, during fermentation. And that will be quite a neutral vessel and your wines that are paler in color have definitely spent time probably in stainless steel tanks. When a wine has that gorgeous yellow color, it has almost always had some contact with oak. And that can either mean that the grape juice was fermented in oak barrels, maybe even stirred on the leaves, which are the dead yeast cells from fermentation, and it will get a beautiful golden color and a nice creaminess, both from the barrel and the leaves. But when you're getting that buttery flavor, that generally means the wine has spent time in a barrel during fermentation or maybe after, Maybe while the white wines rest over the winter, that was done in a barrel and not a stainless steel tank. But also, as I said, the butteriness can come a bit from this thing we call leaves, which are just leftover wine cells from the fermentation. If they're left to sit in the barrel and they're stirred quite carefully, they can introduce this beautiful kind of buttery creaminess to the wine. I hope that makes sense. 
All right, finally, deep big eyes. We're getting to your second question from a while ago, which is about Riesling. And you were wondering why Rieslings are practically never dry. Well, I think I'm here to bust that myth a little bit because I would actually say that the modern trend is toward Rieslings that are dry. But this is an amazing pairing to try for yourself because we've got a little bit of both. So the first Riesling we're going to try is again from the homeland of Riesling. It's a relaxed Riesling and that comes from the Mosul region, uh, region of Germany, which is in Northern Germany. And it's really sort of the heartland where that wine is at a lot of its best bottling. And these do often have what we call residual sugar on them. And so for instance, this wine actually is classified on lcbo.com and on those shelf labels you see in the store as an off dry wine. And you can look up the number of grams of sugar if that's important to you on every wine page on lcbo.com or on that shelf label. But the thing about this relaxed Riesling is you might not know the residual sugar is there because it's paired so beautifully with acidity. So when you take a whiff of this wine, it's just absolutely full of flavors like tangerine, orange zest, lemon and lime zest, grapefruit, a little bit of peach as well. And when I take a sip of this one, it's certainly quite mouth coating, which I think will come into play with the food pairing Eric is going to suggest. But it does finish with a nice dry, again, almost kind of a slate or mineral kind of stone quality at the end that keeps your palate very, very fresh. So I would also say that the modern style for Riesling is to produce them in a way that they do what the winemaker would call ferment to dry. And that means that when you've got your sugary liquid, your grape juice, that you let the yeast do all the work. You let the yeast work and work and work until it eats all the sugar that's there and the wine has been fermented to dry. Instead of stopping the fermentation when there's still some residual sugar in the wine. So that's a more modern style for Riesling. And luckily we've got one here today. We've got a Riesling from Cave Spring, which is a marvelous Niagara region, Ontario winery. Oh, Eric's got it right there. Let's see the label, Eric. Yeah. So Cave Spring makes a number of Rieslings. They're quite known for them. The really beautiful thing with this one, which is the estate Riesling, is again that it comes from old vines. You'll remember we talked about old vines when we tasted the Rodney Strong Charlotte's Home. So in this case, because it comes from old vines, I think the grapes have just this maturity and complexity that you just wouldn't get any other way. And when you give this one a whiff, it's got some of these really diagnostic aromas that we'd expect from a really great Riesling from Northern Germany or Austria or maybe from Alsace. Uh, beeswax, some of them. Sounds strange, I know, but it smells fantastic. And a little note of petrol. And that's a really high quality indicator actually for Riesling. And it's really lush stone and orchard fruit. And by that, I mean peaches, apples, pears, nectarines again, and floral, flowers for days, elderflower, apple blossom. But the beautiful thing is this wine is still dry. It's got a tiny bit of residual sugar, so little you might not even really taste it, but it's there to round out the flavors. And when I see wines like this, I see Riesling, I just think pork, because that's really what they would be served with in their home country. But I think that this wine is really proof to Deep Big Eye's question that Rieslings don't always have to have sugar. And by using those shelf labels and looking at the bottom of the wine page on lcbo.com, you will find tons of Rieslings, especially Ontario Rieslings, that are classified as dry and extra dry, where you get all that flavor without the mouth coatingness of the residual sugar. So Eric, these wines offer a lot of potential, I think, for you to really go to town. We've got the relaxed Riesling, which is an LCBO wine, and this beautiful Cape Spring Estate, which is another vintages essential that you can find year round. Yeah, Rieslings are among the more food friendly wines. They there's so many different styles and they're, they're just that is city that sort of is the, the undercurrent of all of them really pairs well with most foods. Uh, with the this off dry uh, German Riesling, relax. We've uh, matched it to a, a a fish curry. It's sort of done in a South Indian style. Uh, big chunks of halibut, and it's 
cooked in a sauce of onion, tomato, and coconut milk. And this is a very complex spice mix, but it's heavy on the coriander seed and star anise. It's very aromatic. And on top of all that, there's cilantro and lime zest. So there's, in this dish, it's just layer upon layer of flavor. And uh, off dry German Riesling is definitely one of the best uh, to match with curry with coconut milk, especially as a bit of heat that the silkier texture stands up to that aggressive spicing and and the, the stone fruit, I, I get apricot off this one, um, go extremely well with curry. Sometimes there are apricots cooked in curry, so it, this, the pairing makes makes sense. Um, it means a little on the sweet side, but but that balancing acidity, it, it doesn't taste sweet, and that, that acidity is great with fish. Now with the, this beautiful uh, Cave Spring Riesling, the state Riesling from Niagara, we're pairing it with a cider braised sausage pie with scrunch phyllo crust. Now this is a relatively easy dish. It's just sort of sausage meat cooked in a cider and cream, uh, sour cream gravy. And it's topped with these sort of ruffles you make of phyllo, you brush with butter and they get all crispy. And in general, I, I think it's really hard to go wrong when you're serving you know, off, barely off dry to dry Riesling from Niagara. It's really, really good with pork those natural apple flavors you get it are in sync with the cider in this dish and that vibrant acidity cuts through the rich sauce and buttery crust. Yeah, I, I'm with you. It, when, it, when it's pork, it, it's really, really hard to go wrong with Riesling. Yeah. Eric, we've got a question from William. Hi, William. Thanks for your question. And I don't know if you can pull this out of the hat, but William is asking if there's any great dry Riesling from South Africa. And I'm more familiar with dry Riesling from Australia or from new world parts of the United States, like Oregon. But have you heard of any from South Africa? I've, I've never even heard of Riesling from South Africa. They make amazing Chenin Blanc and things like that, or, and yeah. Chardonnay. But um, if you want a really, really good and very dry Riesling, the Clare Eden Valley from Australia, they, they don't come around often, but keep yeah. an eye on vintages. They're, they're amazing and incredible value. And uh, Alsace, um, there's some very good ones on the general list and they regularly come through vintages as well. And they're among the driest of Rieslings. If you, and, and even in uh, uh, Niagara, sometimes the style will be, be quite dry, but. Eric, you did that fun pairing with that sort of mouth coating, slightly sweet, relaxed Riesling and the spicy fish curry. So I have another question for you. Um, someone is asking what kind of wine you would pair with spicy Mexican food. And of course, spicy food is always a bit tricky because the alcohol in wine automatically kind of activates your palate from spice. So if you're not careful with what you're drinking, any kind of alcohol, even a cold beer, a glass of wine that seems like it would be great with spicy food can actually exacerbate the spice effect. So Eric, I'm curious if you have a recommendation here for spicy Mexican pairing. Um, but again, you'd, I would go with with a, an, an off dry Riesling, probably even Germany, because they tend to be lower in alcohol. Like this one is only nine percent alcohol, so it won't set off those spices, and um, the sweetness will kind of gives your mouth a bit of a barrier to that spice, so they kind of balance each other out. But in general, with 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 Mexican food, I really like like an ice cold cerveza. Like you really can't go wrong there. Corona beer, that's what I was getting at. <laughs> it's and it's only 4% alcohol, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we also have a question here from somebody who is called Stiletto Murders. That's intriguing. <laughs> who is asking for a recommendation for a Viognier. I like the Viognier. It's from Paul Mas, uh, M-A-S, Paul, Paul Mas, uh, French négociant that has many good bottlings at different price levels and qualities, and you'll find those cycling in and out of vintages and the LCBO. Um, that's hard to beat. Eric, is there any Viognier that you are fond of? You know what? The, the Connoisseur Viognier from Chile, it's on oh, the general list. It's hard to beat. And it's pretty affordable. Hard to beat I, I would consider that on one of the wine. best white wine values at the entire LCBO. It's, it's consistently right really, really that. good. Yeah. And I think there's one under the Bicicleta label. And there that's might the also be that's an organic bottling. Yeah. yeah. Connoisseur, you're absolutely right from Chile. That is a killer bottle of Viognier. All right. Um, Sophie's also asking, just before we move on to our last wine, which is a red wine 
She's asking if we know how old the old vines are at Cave Spring that they use for the estate. And I don't know. I mean, certainly Sophie I points out they're... even old vines in Canada are under 100. For sure they are. But even a 40-year oh, vine they're... is very old. I, I'm not going to – don't quote me on this, but I think they're around 30 years maybe. And by Sounds Ontario right. standards, that's old. So, yeah. Yeah, by any standards, a 40-year-old vine is quite old. And you will see some gnarly old, century-old bush vines in Spain. But actually, 40 or 50 is starting to get quite old for a grapevine. Thanks for that question, Sophie. So we're going through our last wine pairing. If you have more questions, please get them in now. We're happy to answer them. But finally, red wine fans, we're moving on to a red wine. And I think a perfect red for spring is Pinot Noir. And that's because Pinot, which is made all over the world, the first one we're trying comes from New Zealand, and it happens to come from Marlborough, which is that north part of the South Island of New Zealand and is a cooler climate. And Pinot, which if anybody saw the famous movie, knows uh, from sideways that Pinot is a fussy little grape. But when it's grown in the right climate, it can be just beautiful. And this particular one, the Villa Maria from New Zealand, from the Marlborough region, is a fruitier, lighter style of Pinot Noir. So this one on the nose has just this gorgeous red fruit and red berry aroma, but tart, like cranberries, red currants. And it's got just a little bit of herbaceousness, maybe some rosemary, some thyme, herbs like that. It's just gorgeous. You'll notice I'm drinking that one in a wine tumbler. For me, that's just sort of a lovely weeknight wine. I'd actually pop the bottle in the fridge 20 or 30 minutes before serving it because the brightness and the fruitiness of this one, to me, drink really nicely with a bit of a chill on it. This is not a heavy tannin wine. It's got a nice little crisp bit of tannin at the end, but it doesn't have that grippiness that a bigger red wine would have on your palate. And it lends itself really well to lots of food, I think. So I'm curious to see what Eric will do with that one. Uh, our second red wine is also a big favorite of mine. This one is the Louis Latour Bourgogne. So if you hear somebody talking about Burgundy wine, Burgundy is simply the English word for Bourgogne. And as I mentioned about a lot of old world wines, uh, in France, the area of Burgundy or Bourgogne is where really excellent Pinot Noir is made. In fact, some of the most expensive wines in the world are Burgundies from France. So this Louis Latour is actually an amazing value wine. And when we give this one a sniff, and by the way, I've poured it in a Pinot Noir specific glass. So it's got a big bowl that's perfect for swirling and bringing out all those aromas. And you get just a ton of berries. Some of those tart berries like currant and cranberry, but also lush raspberry and really nice kind of a red cherry aroma. You give that one a sip. And really the magic in these French Pinot Noir, a wine from Burgundy, is the texture. It's so silky. It's silky and soft and velvety on your palate. And if you're a red wine fan who doesn't love tannins, that sort of real grippiness on your palate that you get with a big, punchy red wine. These silky tanned burgundies are for you. There's also a beautiful kind of savory, almost umami note of like toasted nuts, mushrooms, fresh earth, which always reminds me of spring. And those might sound like a strange thing in a wine, but I assure you they're not. They're really savory and nice. I also get a nice little bit of toastiness on that. Again, like a brioche or a breadstick that tells me there's been really some careful treatment with French oak. It's just got that little kiss of toast and butter. Also reminds me with that really clean, slightly mineral finish that these grapes are grown often in clay and limestone soils. And I sometimes feel like I can get a little whiff of that terroir in Burgundy when I taste these wines. So Eric, again, we've got one grape, Pinot Noir, expressing itself two very different ways and I'm eager to see what kind of food you have to match with those. So with the lighter from your um, New Zealand Sauvignon from Villa Maria, we're pairing it with roast chicken. Uh, it's a chicken that's been brined with lemon, rosemary, and honey, and then roasted on a bed of root vegetables that 
which brown and get all caramelized and, and the rendered fat. And they also pick up the aromatics from the brine. Uh, Pinot Noir is my very, very favorite pairing with roast chicken. I always save a burgundy or a nice Pinot, lighter Pinot um, for when I make roast chicken, which is quite often in winter and fall and winter. Um, this one is light and juicy and just perfect with uh, this dish. Uh, it won't overpower white meat, yet it, and those herbal notes like rosemary obviously are perfect with everything going on in the pan there. And um, this wine has a touch of spice, sort of baking spices I get on the finish, which are perfect with carrots. Now with the Burgundy um, from Lou, uh, Latour, we're pairing it with a sort of a savory cobbler. It's Southern style pulled pork. That's all saucy and shredded mixed with corn and it, sort of a drop biscuit is put on top and it's baked. And um, the Burgundy has more body and structure to sort of stand up to a dish that's a little bolder in spicing and flavor. And the, the sort of the spices like smoked paprika it brings out the natural smokiness of, of Pinot Noir grown in Burgundy. And, and this wine particularly, I get a lot of pepper notes and it, it's, it's terrific with those spices. Um, this wine is, it's, it's, it's a, this wine can really bridge white and, and red meat. It's, it's sort of just light enough that it's fine with white meat like pork, but it's, I think it's got enough body to go with uh, red meat as well. Gorgeous wine for sure. But I'm so happy that you paired our Villa Maria with chicken because chick roast chicken and Pinot Noir is one of the world's great pairings, right? Um, Sophie's got another question for us. She's enjoyed Pinot Noirs from Niagara and Prince Edward County, as well as New Zealand and France, and is wondering what the differences are. So I'll tackle that at kind of a top level. It's the soil. We're in different countries with different geology and the soil will be different. And in wine, they call that terroir. And it's really the idea of the climate and the land. Is it on a slope? Is it flat? How much sun does it get? And what is in the soil? Because that has an influence on how the plant grows. A grapevine is a plant and the resulting fruit is a product of whatever was in the soil. As well, there might be slightly different varietals. Uh, so they might be from slightly different, you know, if we talk about a plant like a rose, there isn't one rose. There are dozens if not hundreds of varietals so when we talk about pinot noir there's many clones and so in different countries you're likely to have the vines grown from different clones which is actually a slightly different variety of the plant and then weather of course in canada we probably are forced to harvest our grapes a lot earlier because of danger of frost um, that is also true in new zealand and france but every growing region has its little specialties and then we haven't even touched upon winemaking. And there's so many differences in how you might ferment the grape juice, the different yeast, the tradition of how you use barrels and what type of wood. Are they American oak? Are they French oak? Are they Hungarian oak? How long is that wine left to ferment? How long is it left in the barrel? How is it blended? It's just a, a whole range of differences. And this is a wine, if you get a chance to try these two for yourself side by side, to try a fruitier Pinot Noir, and one of these earthier, more savory pinots. It's really incredible how this grape lends itself to a couple of different styles. We're just about getting ready to wrap up, but Eric, I've got one question for you from Sue. Hi, Sue, thanks for your question. And she's wondering if you have any vegetarian pairing recommendations for Pinot Noir, which I think would be gorgeous, because as you pointed out, it's got these oh, yeah. earthy notes in a nice pinot, and that's great with so many veggies. Pinot Noir is amazing with mushrooms. I think it's actually the best wine, one of the best wines you can serve with mushrooms. So mushroom risotto, you know, mushroom pasta, you know, stuffed mushrooms, anything like that. Um, I like Pinot Noir with lentil dishes, sort of lentil stew, maybe with a little sausage in it. Oh, sorry. Or you could have vegan. They make vegan sausages now, so you can put that in it. <laughs> Good call. Um, but that's, you know, vegetarian cuisine tends to be on the lighter side. So I would probably limit it at that. I mean, there are probably other things, but um, those two are the ones off the top of my head. I love it. Thanks for all your questions tonight, everybody. I think we're going to wrap it up. And I'll just remind you that if you loved 
the look of any of these wines and you want to check out some of these recipes Eric's recommending, recommending from the Food and Drink Archive, they're all on the YouTube event description page and there's links set up there right for you to click through directly to this collection of recipes and wine pairings. If you want to pick up these wines at your local store, of course you can shop in person, but we find a lot of people now are doing their preparation on lcbo.com and checking in advance if the wine is at your store. If it's not, of course, you can always order it online for delivery in store. That can take up to 14 days, but just about anything the LCBO has can be available right in your neighborhood. We also have more than 180 stores that have same day pickup, which is incredible. That's click and then go collect it in less than three hours at stores that offer that service. And then finally, our stores have curbside pickup, which is safe, contactless way to go get all the things you need. And so I think with that, we're going to sign off. I'd encourage you to check back often on lcbo.com, especially on the virtual events page to see what else is coming up. We generally have four or five events a month. And Eric, I hope you and I will do another one together soon. Cheers. Sounds good. Cheers. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for joining us.